session moderator Shri K P Umapati Acharya. Shri Gopu was born and brought up in Madras. He obtained his B.E. in Computer Engineering from Arulmigu Kalasalingam College of Engineering, Shri Viliputur, and he holds an M.S. in Computer Science from Texas A&M University, U.S. He was employed as a software engineer in Microsoft at Seattle, Washington and also had his brief stint of employment at MicroAge, Arizona and Decide.com, California. Wanting a change from software field, he returned to India to pursue a career in writing and screenplay writing. Sri Gopu has been a voracious reader on topics related to economics, evolution, genetics, history, astronomy, and learning Sanskrit to better understand India and our heritage. He has lectured on Pallava Grantha, inscriptions of Mamallapuram, the Vishwantara Jataka painting of Ajanta, astronomy of ancient cultures, cultures and Indian astronomy for the Tamil heritage group. He has also lectured on rediscovery of Bihar's history in Patna. Dear Gopusa, we welcome you to the dais to talk about the history of Cholas. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I must first thank Professor Swaminathan for uh, introducing me to a uh, whole world of heritage and Mr. Uh, recommending me as a speaker to Mr. Gurumurthy and Mr. Gurumurthy and the Rotary Club of Coimbatore for inviting me to speak. Most of the speakers here are professionals, but as Mr. Gurumurthy said, uh, there are a couple of amateurs uh, from other fields. Uh, speaking after Dr. Nagaswamy, uh, it's a little like asking your grandson to recite a nursery rhyme after listening to the Mahabharata. It's, it's a pretty overwhelming experience. And some of the other speakers were themselves somewhat nervous about it because even though they are professional historians and have lectured in several fora, uh, speaking after a legend in their own lifetime, like Dr. Nagaswamy, is uh, something that is uh, nerve-inducing. And they can relax because they don't have to speak after Nagaswamy, they have to speak after me. <coughs> um, on the positive side, uh, or on the slightly negative side for me, I am supposed to speak about the history of the Cholas. The later history of the Cholas covers about 450 years. And I am giving you a summary of it in 45 minutes. So this is going to be kind of an SMS version of history. Um, and let me, without much ado, let me speak. Uh, the Cholas that we are going to be discussing today mostly are from uh, around 850. But the uh, Chola era really started in the Sangam period around 300 BC uh, and I want to make a distinction between what we consider today Tamil Nadu and what in history has been known as the Tamil speaking country Tamil Pesum Nallulagam and the Tamil, Pesum, the Tamil speaking country is actually the area bounded on the north by Vada Venkatam, the Venkata hill, uh, Venkateshwara Tirupati hill to Tenkumari, Kanyakumari and from eastern sea to western sea. And so this means naturally that it included Kerala for a very large part of history and one, uh, you, you should probably be aware now that Malayalam as a language which is the dominant language in Kerala today really evolved independently as a, as a separate language from Tamil, distinct, distinct language from Tamil somewhere between the 8th and the 10th centuries. So until that point um, Kerala was also part of what is called Tamilagam. Um, in speaking of Tamilagam, most people think only of the Chera, Chola and Pandya kingdoms, but it actually had a, an enormous number of uh, geographical regions. The Chera, Chola and Pandyas of the Sangam era actually occupied a very small area. And these are the geographical uh, na names of the geographical sub-countries uh, sub or regions, if you could call them that, um, that existed in that time. And this is a poem that gives you the names of those lands. Tenpandi Kuttam Kudam, each of this is the name of land. Tenpandi Nadu, Kutta Nadu, Kudanadu, Karka, Vain Puri, Pandri, Aruva, Adanvadak means Vada Aruva. Nandraya is just a description. Sida Nadu, Malanadu, and Punanadu. And Punanadu, Punal is water. Punanadu was the original Swaranadu. And this is actually a map of the Tamil country as it existed in the Sangam period. And you can see all the names listed um, on the western side. For example, you have um, Kudanadu and Kuttanadu and Venadu and uh, the Cholas really ruled around Urayur which is modern Trichy, uh, the Pandyas around Madurai um, and the Cheras even though this map lists them as somewhere in Kerala in the Sangam era they actually occupied their capital 
in Karur, which is not very far from Trichy, it is about 40-50 kilometers, and that was their area. And I showed this map because it makes a common mistake about that early period. Uh, the three kings of that period, the major kings, uh, are the Chera, Chola and Pandyas, which most people are familiar with. They were, they were called the Muvendar and the Mudisudum Mannar because they were recognized as somewhat more special than the other kings. The minor kings of, that, of the rest of Tamilagam were called, some of them were called Velir kings. And Velirs, the name Velir comes from Velvi, which is the Tamil word for Yagna. And some of these kings uh, claim to be of the Agnikula and uh, that's why they're called the Velirs. And most of the famous uh, other kings, you've probably heard of the Kadayed Vallalhal, uh, kings like Adiyaman, Tondaman, Pari, Kari, Ori and all these people and these are all Velir kings. And uh, they also ruled independently in the Sangam era. And the rivers of Tamil Nadu form natural borders for um, these, uh, even for the three major kingdoms, uh, the Chera country, the Chola country and the Pandya country. While the Chola country centered was, Kaveri was the center of the Chola country. It was bounded on the north by the Tenpenne river and the south by the Vellaru river and Vellaru marked the northern border of the Pandya kingdom. We have fairly little information about the kings of the Sangam era, either Chola, Chera or Pandya. Uh, some of the names that are familiar to us are Perunar Killi, Nalan Killi and Nedun Killi. Nalan Killi and Nedun Killi were brothers and unfortunately what's famous about them is that they had, a, uh, had an internecine uh, fight, fight fought over their own kingdom. And this unfortunately is the story of all royal families through history, not just in India but across the world and it continues today perhaps in modern politics, even in democratic politics. But the really famous Chola king of that Sangam era is Karigal Perivalatta. Valavan is a name that is given to any Chola king. It, uh, the words for Chola kings are Chola, Valavan and Sembian. The word Sembian comes from their uh, descent from Sibi Chakravarti. And uh, Valavan because it is the most fertile land in Tamil Nadu and it is, uh, some of you may be familiar with a poem by Avvaya that says, Vedam Mudaitu Malay Nadu. Malay Nadu is Kerala, has elephants, Vedam. Medakka Sora Balanadu Sor Vudaitu. Swadanadu is full of rice. Puriyurkon Tennadu Muttudaitu. The southern country of the Pandyas has pearls. It's what's extremely famous export of the Pandyas. And Tennirvayal Tondainanadu Sanro Vudaitu. So the fertility of the um, uh, Kaveri Delta and of the Cholanadu was famous for a very, has been famous and continues to be famous even in today when there is uh, water only for some of the time. Uh, Karigal Valavan is famous for two of his achievements. One is building of the stone dam, the Kallanai. The other is raising the banks of the Kaveri. And Karigal Valavan is extensively talked about in Patinapalai and Salapadigaram, uh, two of the literary works of that time. He is also famous for the Battle of Venni. Venni is now a small gramam, a village called Kovil Venni near Kumbakonam. And he defeated the Chera king, the Pandya king and 11 other chieftains. So imagine all these 13 people forming an alliance to fight Karigal and it tells you the might of his empire at that time. And the, while the literature of the times talks extensively about very advanced societies, ports, harbors, industry, cities, temples and everything, we have very little in original condition surviving from the Sangam age. <clears throat> there are also foreign accounts of, these, uh, of the Sangam age. Uh, three famous accounts are Periplus of the Eritrean Sea, which is uh, written by an unknown sailor and uh, a geography of Strabo and the natural history of Pliny, who was a Roman senator, and of course the Sangam poetry, and of course Silapadigaram and Manimegalai. There was another king, the, probably the last of the Chola kings of the Sangam age, called Ko Chengannan, and he is famous for having built several temples in the Sangam era, but uh, thanks to the uh, ra ravages of history, we don't have too many temples of his era uh, in their original shape. In the Sangam era, Tamil country was, today we think of uh, country, religions in India as Hinduism, Christianity and uh, Islam and Sikhism. But in the Sangam era, the dominant religions were a religion that most people have not heard of called Ajivika. There is the only remaining temple of the Ajivika uh, religion is in Bihar. And uh, Buddhism and Jainism held forth with Hinduism in that period. I have a stupa from Ajanta because... 
uh, but the Jain monument here is from a place in Pudukote called Aruti Malai. And of course, Hindu, there is there's evidence of Hinduism is of course all over the place. The Sangam era also had a number of uh, different deities than we are probably used to. And the era following the Sangam era, village deities which continue to be in worship. There are town guardians like the Nalangadi Budam mentioned in Salapati Karam. Somewhat personal gods, gods and goddesses like the Champapati Devam and the Manimegala Devam. But also in the Tolkapiyam are mentioned Mayon, Seyon, Vendan and Varunan. Mayon is Krishna or Vishnu, Seyon is Murga, Vendan is Indra and Varunan is of course Varuna. And finally Korkai. And these are the five gods of the five different Tinais. Kurunji, Mullai, Maradam, Palai and Naidal. <coughs> this gives you a brief history, a brief timeline of the uh, era of the Cholas. It starts with 300 BC to 300 AD, which most people think is the era of the Sangam. Then it is followed by an interregnum called the Kalabra interregnum, when the Chera Chola Pandya kingdoms were overrun by a dynasty called the Kalabras or the Kalapalas. And uh, these people, this is very little is known about this age. Possibly a king called Achuta Kalapala defeated all three of them. But for 250 years, we have very little information about what they did. Uh, what their achievements were, what the, rule, the names of the rulers, what their accomplishments were, their administrative, we have very little. So it's called the dark ages uh, of Indian history. So there's a big discontinuity. At the end of this period, around 550, um, the old Pandya kingdom revived. They defeated the Kalabras. And in the north, the new Pallava dynasty, the Pallavas had been minor kings of other dynasties in the north ruling from Nellur. And they captured their kingdom on Kanchi and expanded an empire in the north. So the northern Tamil Nadu was ruled by the Pallavas and southern Tamil Nadu was ruled by the Pandyas with uh, kings like the Cholas and the other minor fidatory kings paying, being Kappam Kattum Rajakal or fidatory kings paying tribute to these major king em empires. But this period is very important and I will get to that a little later. Around 870, <coughs> the Pandyas continued of course until 970 or so. But around 870, around 850 a king called Vijayalaya of the Chola dynasty captured uh, Tanjavur. And from this point starts the glorious history of the Cholas called the age of the imperial Cholas. And it continues all the way up to 1280 when they are finally defeated by the Pandyas. And then it, the Pandya dynasty continued up to 1310 at which point we had uh, the invasion of Malik Kafur. And that was followed by 40 years by a lot of confusion after which the Vijayanagar empire established itself as the sovereign ruler of all of Tamil Nadu, of all of South India in fact. The Kalabra period and the Pallava period are extremely important for Chola history because something called the Bhakti movement, which of course Dr. Nagaswami talked about, this is the movement of the Arvars and the Nayanmars. An enormous outpouring of Bhakti, an enormous outpouring of music, song and literature was started by Arvars, starting with Karaka Lamayar and but famously of Upper Sundarar and Yanasambandar. And for the Arvars, the 12 famous Arvars, all this way from the Budal Arvars, Pei Arvar, Budat Arvar and Pudige Arvar, Followed by the very famous Arvars, of course, Peri Arvar and uh, <coughs> Andal and Kulasekar Arvar and Thirumangai Arvar, ending with Thirumangai Arvar roughly in the time of Nandivarman Pallavamalla. And what these people did was, in their devotion, they traveled all over the country and they sang of not just of God in general, but also of the iconic deities of specific temples. We, the Arvar sang of 108 temples, two of which are Paramapadam and uh, Vaikuntam, or 106 of them are on earth. And the Nayanmars talked of 275 temples on, on earth. And so these specific temples have the special grace called Padal Petra Kovil or Padal Petra Stalam. And in the Vaishnava tradition, they are also called Divya Desams. These carry a sig special significance because they are very important to the devotees of these two religions. And Paying attention to this, an enormous amount of work went into building, maintaining, improving and expanding these temples by monarchs, not just the Pallavas, but also the Pandyas, the Chodas and the subsequent kings that came after. <coughs> the other thing that happened during this period was the decline of Buddhism and Jainism to the extent that we have very little of uh, Buddhist monuments and only scattered remnants of Jain monuments from that time. Most importantly, we believe that the temples that existed before this period um, were mostly consistent, built of brick or timber and perhaps even mud. But the beginning of stone temple architecture, which means that the temples survived for a long time in a permanent form with very little alteration, started around this period. 
and it's very important because most of the Chola temples that we know are of basically stone architecture. And art historians divide uh, Dravidian stone temples. Now, uh, before I move on to the Dravidian architecture, I must say that art historians generally classify temples into three or four major categories. The Dravidian arch architecture, which is mostly South Indian, the Vesara architecture and the Nagari architecture of the north. We will not talk about those two today, just confine ourselves to the south. The Pallavas and the Pandyas were the early proponents of the Dravidian stone temples. And this and, and uh, Dravidian stone temples are divided into four phases by art, art historians corresponding to the uh, dynasties to some extent but also the Chola temples are divided themselves into two different sets the early Chola starting with Vajalaya and the imperial Chola starting with Raja Raja and finally afterwards by the Vijayanagara and the Nayaka phase um, if I may offer a contemporary uh, uh, simile or metaphor you can think of this as our cell phones or our uh, computers. You can think of the Pallava Pandya phase as the 1G, the early Cholas as 2G, the Imperial Cholas as 3G and the Vijayanagar Nayaka as 4G. And I don't know what some of the modern uh, cement and concrete structures and some damage would be co considered, cons uh, you know, what, what name they, should, they would come up with, but I think they have held themselves in abeyance over that. So this is a very famous temple. This is a stone temple that's uh, excavated stone temple in a hillock in a village called Mandagappattu, uh, not far from Senji. And uh, this is extremely famous because this is the oldest temple excavated by Mahendra Varma Pallava in the north. And this is the famous inscription by him. Uh, you probably can't read it, it's in Sanskrit and it's in a script called Pallava Grantha. And Pallava Grantha, which is perhaps invented by Mahendra Varma Pallava, but perhaps may have been before him, is a script used by all kings in South India to write Sanskrit or Prakrit as opposed to Devanagari which is mostly used in the north and which continues to, to be used today. And what this, script, on what this inscription states in Sanskrit is Ethad Anishtam Adhrumam Aloham Asutam Vichitra Chittena Nirmapita Nirpena Brahmeshwara Vishnu Lakshita Yatanam. And what this means is Vichitra Chitta which is the name of Mahendra Varma Pallava has caused this temple of Brahma, Ishwara and Vishnu to be built. Anishtam, without brick, a dhrumam, without timber, a loham, without metal, a sudam, without mortar. And this is way of saying I carved a temple out of stone. And this was an example that was then followed. And a similar temple was built in, uh, in Palayarpati probably by the, an unknown Pandya. And this tradition was then uh, continued by his descendants, the later Pallavas. And they started building a whole number of stone temples. This is not a brick temple of the Sangam age, but this is what perhaps some of the temples before the stone temple architecture were uh, looked like. This one, this is one we saw near, uh, near a village in uh, Tanjavur called uh, Mathur. And this is roughly what the structure, you can see some of the semblances of the structures. But this is what the Cholas and the, the Pallavas did and later the Cholas did. This is a purely granite temple, as you can see. Every part of it is built with granite except the little cement addition at the bottom. <coughs> and this is the difference between a granite structure and a mortar or a brick structure. One other distinction that other people will, the other lecturers through the day and tomorrow will also talk about is the distinction between the Vimanam and the Gopuram. The Vimanam is the roof of the sanctum or the Sanadi and the Gopuram is the building on top of the entrance. We have an unfortunate habit probably because of the uh, Vijayanagar Gopura, the Gopurams, that any tall structure is called Gopuram. But uh, Gopuram is really the structure on top of the uh, entrance. And this Gopuram on top of this building is probably of the Nayak era and uh, perhaps also maintained recently. And uh, that's, made, and that's made substantially out of mortar or Sudai. And you can see the difference. The base of most Gopurams will be made of granite and the superstructure will be made of mortar. <clears throat> now, most of you have traveled around the country and you have seen temples made out of marble, of soapstone, of sandstone and cement. I wanted to show a Rajasthani temple like Dilwara, but uh, I chose this one which is a much more, mo because I had a good photograph of it. This is actually built in Toronto. This is a Swaminarayan temple. Um, this temple is entirely of marble. And there are people who are very great aficionados of marble and 
there is a movement in tamil nadu across uh, across the state not just in tamil nadu of marbling our temples they are putting marble faces to existing granite perhaps because they think granite has an old look and marble has a new look and the temple the choice of stone of granite is mainly because of the local availability what stones are locally available are used the so soapstone temples of the dark black softer stone marble soapstone and sandstone are actually softer stones than granite they are somewhat easier to carve the sandstone temples are actually from orissa this one is uh, called the rajarani temple in bhubaneswar and these three structures are used because they are the locally available stones and now of course because perhaps cement and concrete are cheap we use these to construct them uh marble soapstone and sandstone and lend themselves to a great deal of intricate carvings and there is perhaps certain amount of jealousy from the uh, people of this uh, area that the intricacy of the carvings the laziness the uh, and it's not it's also something that affects foreign tour tourists and north indians because they see mostly uh, elegant thin lacy marble buildings how is intricacy possible in granite for that let me go to this that does granite and look at the size of that sculpture that's my thumb and that's my forefinger that sculpture is literally the size of my palm and professor swaramakrishnan will give you a lecture on this temple this is in a temple called kumbakonam called nageshwaram in kumbakonam called nageshwaram not trinageshwaram nageshwaram um, and this is usually not noticed by most people these are sculptures from the ramayana look at this one this one is a sculpture of vishwamitra teaching rama how uh, archery and there is another temple in pullamangai which is a similar thing where vishwamitra is teaching rama archery you see the elegance and the intricacy of the sculpture here and i want people to appreciate imagine covering this up with marble because you are embarrassed about granite or because it looks old and that's something that unfortunately happens a lot this is also the size this is trivikrama measuring the earth and the sky this is mahishasura mardini on her lion these are all chola temples built by uh, i think this one is built by parantaka chola and this is gaja samhara murti shiva dancing after uh, killing gajasura and wearing his skin around him <coughs> so while marble <coughs> sandstone and soapstone lend themselves to a great of great deal of intricacy we should also acknowledge the brilliant skill of chola era pandya era and pallava time and uh, uh, sculptors of this uh, region vishwakarmas like mr umapati stapati who have done a tremendous amount of work in uh, and have a long hoary tradition of building fantastic granite temples the gigantism of uh, some temple like the rajaraja chola temple in uh, tanjavur or the bradishwara temple in Gang uh, in gangai kunda chodapuram or darasuram temple should not take away from the workmanship of some of the miniatures and the other intricacies of the sculptures um let me go back to so i told you about the early chola period after the in around 850 ad one of the chola kings called vijayalaya chola decided to wage war against the ruling king of tanjavur at that time vijayalaya remember the cholas were had their capital in urayur which is now in a suburb of trichy and he attacked with his army the mutrayar kings of tanjavur defeated them <coughs> and captured tanjavur as a city and he decided to shift the capital from urayur to tanjavur so the 1000 year long capital urayur was abandoned in favor of tanjavur and this turned to be a fortuitous uh, movement move on the part of the cholas because most of us today associate tanjavur with the cholas <coughs> perhaps because of the brahadeshwara temple and in gratitude for this victory he built a temple for nishimba sudani in uh, tanjavur and uh, vijayalaya is considered the starter or the uh, petra familias of the imperial line of the imperial cholas but vijayalaya was a feudatory of the pallava king at that time aparajita pallava or uh, actually nirvatunga pallava and uh, what happened was vijayalaya's son aditya who had fought on nirvatunga's side against the pandyas so he was a feudatory of the pallavas and he had fought a war for nrapatunga against the pandyas later on aditya decided that this was his chance and there was a there was a internecine feud between nrapatunga and aparajita and aditya pallava <coughs> aditya chola 
defeated Aparajita Pallava and expanded the scope of the Chola Empire and that is pretty much the end of the Pallava Empire and this is the line of the imperial Cholas from this point Vijayalaya, his son Aditya, his son Viranarayana Parantaka of whom I will talk a little later then his three sons Raja Aditya, Gandhara Aditya and Arinjaya Gandhara Aditya is also somebody I will talk about a little later and his famous wife Sembian Mahadevi and it is Raja Aditya died in battle, Gandhara Aditya uh, died early but didn't want his son to inherit the kingdom so his younger brother Arinjaya later inherited the kingdom and became king Arinjaya's son Parantaka II or Sundara Choda he was called so because he was extremely beautiful extremely handsome became the next king after Arinjaya and then there was a fight because uh, Sundara wanted his elder son Aditya Karikala to become the king and he crowned him the crown prince but Uttama Choda the son of Gandhara Aditya was not happy with his father's move to dethrone him and uh, take away the kingdom from him so there was a fight between, there was a quarrel between Uttama Choda and Aditya Karikala and in some mysterious circumstance Aditya Karikala was murdered. Uh, in, a, in a move of peace, that, son, that remaining son of Sundara Choda called Arulmuri Varman decided to give up the throne in favor of, in favor of his uncle Uttama Choda. But when Uttama Choda after a rule of 15 years gave up his kingdom, Arulmuri Varman then became the king and Arulmuri Varman is now the one we famously know as Rajaraja Choda. Now we'll go back to Aditya Choda for a little bit. I told you about the internecine fight between Ripatunga and Aparajita Pallava and uh, uh, I will not talk about G Ganga Prativiti. Aditya defeats Aparajita at the Tirupurambiyam war which is a famous war because it marks the end of like the Veddi war that marked the triumph of Karigala. The Aditya's uh, Tirupurambiyam war marked the triumph of the Cholas and their rise for the next 400 years and this marked also the end of the Pallava empire. Aditya Chola is not just famous for starting the imperial line of Cholas but also for bringing, building 72 temples or rebuilding 72 temples across along the banks of the Kaveri. And what he did was construct old temples made of mostly brick and timber into temples made of granite. He remodeled them. They, perhaps the sanctum remained the same, the idol remained the same, but they rebuilt the temple uh, in mostly in granite form. Aditya was followed in line by his uh, son Parantaka. Now Parantaka also called Viranarayana was actually the younger son. His elder son was a uh, king, was a prince called Kanardeva and his, he was a daughter of, he was the son of a Rashtrakuta princess but for some reason his father chose Parantaka to follow him and it seemed to be a wise choice. Now Parantaka we don't hear about, Viranarayana we don't hear about mostly because Rajaraja and Rajendra tend to dominate most people's conversation besides Karigala. But Viranarayana Parantaka was a king for 50 years, one of the longest reigns of of a king not just for the Cholas but of any king in Indian history and he it was he who laid the strong tremendous enormous foundation of the Chola dynasty to come for the next 300 years or so <coughs> as I mentioned Kandra Deva his elder brother Veera Pandya first defeated the Pandyas uh, Veera Narayana defeated the Pandyas and he also had a battle against Elam but he didn't hold the land at that point he is probably most well remembered for the Viranam lake that is named after him. Towards the end of his re uh, reign, um, what happened was that the Rashtrakuta king uh, Krishna launched a war against uh, uh, the Cholas, perhaps in sympathy for his uh, nephew Kanardeva. But, uh, uh, and Viranarayana staged, uh, uh, asked his son, deputed his son, the eldest son Rajaditya to uh, stage an army to prevent that Rashtrakuta invasion and this was near what we call the Viranam lake and that army was waiting for the invasion of Rashtrakutas and uh, while the army was waiting uh, Rajaditya being not just an able general but also an able administrator and a commander probably decided that uh, um, the military should not be uh, uh, wasted uh, to do other mischief so he employed them to dig a very large lake so it's not just temples that are the remnants of uh, the Chola Empire. It's also lakes that live today. And uh, Viranam Lake is really a mispronunciation of Viranarayanam Lake. He named it after his father. One of the other achievements of Parantaka Choda was that he covered the Chidambaram temple roof with gold. And he was called Punvain the Chodan because of that. But mostly he is perhaps famous for the Uttarameru inscription that uh, was earlier mentioned by Mr. Gurumurthy also. Now, um, 
uh, invasion of Rashtrakuta I told you about. This is a small temple in Uttaramerur and it's called the Vaikuntha Pirumal Temple. There is actually a larger uh, Varada, Vaikuntha Varada temple of the Pallava era. I want you to notice the very long inscription on the side of the wall there. And this is famous because this talks about the local, about the structure of the village in the Chola era. It talks extensively about local autonomy. Now most of us have read in history or civics that Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi said that India is a nation of 700 independent self-sufficient village republics. You probably remember this phrase. I wonder if Gandhi stumbled upon the Uttaramiru inscription at some point because this talks about a real village republic. The Uttaramiru inscription tells us that the village of Township of Uttaramiru had something called the Kuda Olai system to choose its administrators. <coughs> the Kuda is a pot, Olai is a palm leaf. The candidates for the people of administrative jobs, they had boards called variums to administer different things. The temple, the town, the lakes, the irrigation canals and so on. And these, the names of eligible candidates were put in a pot and they were chosen by random. Uh, by, by random selection. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of uh, journalists call this election or democracy. It's not really a democracy or an election. It's a selection and a somewhat republican form of government, but the, uh, which is something that I want to emphasize. But fundamentally, what's very important to uh, remember from the Kodawali system and the Uttaramiru inscription is that they had very rigorous educational qualifications. They also had a very rigorous uh, restraints on their character. There are certain things that they are not supposed to do. I am not going into detail because I have uh, very little time to talk about this. But there are also constraints that they had to be landowners, they had to be landowners and it was confined to men. <clears throat> there are also severe fines and possibility of dismissal if they had not performed up to the job or if they had broken the law or if they had broken a code of moral conduct. And disqualification would not just necessarily be for a person who committed the uh, illegality, but his entire family would be banned. And one of the other reasons why it's not an election is because they had term limits. And what that means is that one person held a post, he cannot come back to that post for a, uh, for example, if the, each term was roughly three years, in some uh, variums it was six years. If he held, somebody held a post for three years, he was not eligible to hold a post again for the next 12 years or nine years. So this is a way of making sure that you not stay in, stay in position and use the benefits of the position to enjoy the office of profit, uh, make it an office of profit. Um, finally, most people talk about administration and the form of government, but one of the things that also establishes is that they had a substantially free market. The Chola era also had a free market, but I guess economics tends to be very boring when you are talking about art. So, um, Now, why does this inscription, inscription about administration have to be carved on the wall of a temple? Because the role of temples in Tamil Nadu, especially in India in general, is a very major one. They are not just centers of religious uh, and uh, congregational worship. They were also used as centers of administration, of the economy, of finance. Some of the temples had funds, independent funds. They would have emergency funds of medicine, of famine relief. You go to the temple, you see you, most temples give you a prasada. A prasada is given, the same prasada is given regardless of your economic status or your social status. And in times, terms of famine, this is a tremendous social relief that's institutionalized. People don't uh, necessarily uh, realize that. And last but not least, art and music. For a thousand years plus, we had Devadasi system, which has now fallen into disuse and disrepute for the last uh, 80 years or so. But an extensive system of musical performances, institutionalized dancers, Worship of the temple by dancers, the Devadasis of the temples of Cholas, Pandyas and Pallavas had the same status as the Pujaris, the Brahmanas who performed worship at that time. And you will see a lot of sculptures of these people in those temples. And two important things to talk about are the Devadhanam. A Devadhanam is a grant of land for a temple. So the temple would not be dependent financially only on the uh, contributions of patrons but also on temple property. We still have this, more temple-owned properties. People give property to temple today. And another is called the Brahmadeya. The Brahmadeya is different from lands given to temples. It is land given to Brahmanas. Think of it as a scholarship, except it's a scholarship not in cash, but in kind. They are given land to sustain themselves. And finally, even the ministers, to some extent of that time, were paid in kind. They, they were given lands 
from which to sustain their uh, livelihood and this lasted for their life and so it was called jivitam because it was to last for their uh, lives um, i am talking somewhat about uh, administration structure of a town economy tax and all that stuff because i want you to get i am i am giving a very generic view of what the chola era looked like because the temples that we are going to talk about depended on this on these things the temples served a purpose beyond just their religious and uh, sculptural uh, purpose the chola town or village was probably divided into three major divisions the ur we use the word ur and nagaram interchangeably today but in the chola era it probably ur meant the where the ag farmers stayed and perhaps the artisans and the nagaram meant where the merchants stayed and the agraharam or the sabha and sometimes some of these villages are called chaturvedi mangalams or mangalams they are donated to a brahmanas and this is where the brahmanas stayed though some in some cases i think the sabhas are also generic forums there are several uh, generic forums general forums and finally uh, some villages or some townships were also called padaipatris where soldiers uh, think of them as cantonments of uh, the modern era we think of these things as modern divisions they were not they were very old and we have inscriptional evidence not from the sangam era but we have inscriptional evidence from the chola era um i'm going to go one more dose on water management taxes two of the most important taxes we have evidence of 400 different taxes from the chola inscriptions now that sounds like an accountant's dream or a businessman's nightmare but uh, <clears throat> the taxes served a purpose though you can only have 400 taxes in a very very vast rich and powerful economy in a small tiny economy you can't levy this many taxes but most of the taxes are actually uh, emergency taxes most of them were not uh, established taxes two of the most famous taxes are kadamai are called kadamai and kudimai kadamai is really a tax land on land owners and kudimai is a tax assessed on the laborers and the people who farmed and perhaps artisans there is a separate tax for artisans and other businessmen called the ayam and uh, there were independently taxes for maintaining canals tanks wells and so on now this is important to know because today we don't think of water transport as a major part of our transportation we have roadways railways and airways when will we have shipping as major water transport except perhaps in kerala and along the ganga but our water transport was extraordinarily important in ancient india uh, <clears throat> there an extensive network of canals maintained in the in the chola time there interlinked lakes excess of water from one lake could fill into the other <clears throat> the advantage of a water ta water transportation mostly by boats is that a large load can be transported comfortably by water transport because of the buoyancy of water and the capacity of the fundamentally they are cheap fast and you can't break an axle of a boat you can do it on a bullock cart bullock carts and uh, the major mode of transport uh, were severely restricted and remember roads are difficult to maintain most of the roads were mud roads we had torrential rains at some times and dry hot summers and so roads were of probably mediocre quality at that time <clears throat> so water transport is a major trans major system of uh, transport uh, in the chola era now we will move to what these three kings did uh, vijay uh, uh, now most of us uh, think of temples as the massive temples of uh, tanjavur brahadeshwara and um, uh, the ganga the gangai kunda cholapuram i want to show some other aspect of the early chola temples i showed you about the intricacy i'm going to show you the kind of temples that they built this of course is the very famous gangai kunda cholapuram unfortunately in very small scale but look at this tiny little temple this is also a temple built by a royal king this is built by parantaka and it is in a tiny village called kaliyapatti near uh, pudukote <coughs> this is a temple or a set of temples there are three temples but only two of them are existing the third one is uh, empty this was built by a minor chieftain called the kodumbalur velirs uh, i told you about the velirs the kodumbalur velirs were uh, a long dynasty that ruled from kodumbalur for a very long time and uh, <clears throat> those of you who are kalki fans and have read ponniyan selvan probably remember them from the siriya velar and budhi vikrama kesari who assisted sundara chola and uh, the other chola the chola empire these temples were built by the 
Kodumbalur kings. So it's not just that the imperial Cholas, the Pandyas, etc. built the king's uh, temples, but also the minor chieftains built them. And this is a temple in uh, Thirukkattalai near uh, uh, Pudukkottai. It's about 5 kilometers from Pudukkottai. And with, this is important for the slightly different architecture of the temples. You see the small shrine around it. Those are the, this temple has seven small sub around it called the Parivara Devata shrines. And this is something that's a feature that you don't see later. Though later on, you have temple shrines like uh, the separate shrines for Thayar, for either uh, uh, Parvati or for Lakshmi, um, and for Murga and Subramanya. But in the early period, you had shrines like this. Now, this is an absolutely marvelous temple that most people have never heard of, called the Vajayalaya Choliswaram. This is in a small village called Narthamalai. And you can see the setting of the temple far away in a beautiful lake with the, in, the, in the hill. What prompted this king to put this uh, temple there? I don't know, but it's a marvelous temple. And if, if you get a chance, you should go and see it. Uh, and this is a view of the temple from uh, the hillock above it. And you can see that this temple also has certain Parivara shrines. Besides this, the other thing I want to talk about is the expressions of the sculptures on the table, on the temples. This is a very elegant, there is an elegance to this sculpture that I want you to look at. And what else is there? You saw Ananda Tandava in various pro pro portions. This is a depiction in Nageshwaram temple. Does that strike valor to you? Does that say valor? Ferocity? Spirituality perhaps, tenderness, S tranquility, elegance, tranquility and a soft smile of Vinadara Dakshinamurti, of Vasudeva. This is also another Dakshinamurti, but what's interesting about this Dakshinamurti is not just the Dakshinamurti there, but the lion, ferocious lion to one side and a pair of lions on the other side. It's so tranquil that one of the lions has gone to sleep on the lap of the other. And humor is also a part of our sculpture, not to mention monkeys. I just wanted to get you a flavor of this uh, uh, structure of these temples. After I told you about Sembian Madevi, the wife of Gandharaditya, she is a very important queen. It's not just the kings who built temples in India in the Chola period, but also uh, she is a very famous queen who, who commissioned an enormous number of uh, temples, bronzes, and uh, a whole face of the early Chola temples is named after her. So you can see, and uh, I think uh, Chitra Madhavan is going to talk about me, is going to talk after me, is going to talk about some of her temples. And I'll move on past this. We, these are the sources of history, and I'm going to move past this. After this comes Sundara Chola. In Sundara Chola's time, and Sundara Chola is the father of Radharaja, uh, uh, Aditya marched against the Pandya king of the time, defeated him, and the Chola empire became a very large empire. It included the Pandya empire also for the first time. And very an interesting political development that took place at this point was the fall of the Rashtrakutas as the primary rivals of the Cholas in the north and the rise of the Kalyani Chalukyas. I'm going to skip this for the lack of time. After Sundara, Uttama Chola, of course, assumes power uh, in, the, in the compromise that is assumed, uh, in, that was uh, settled between the two princes, but the prince that you are all waiting for, Rajaraja Choda, came to power in 985. Rajaraja Choda comes, calls himself the conqueror of Gangapadi and Nolambapadi. He is also a Kerala Antakan. Besides adding, besides Madura, he also conquered Kerala and gave himself the title of Kerala Antakan. He is famous justifiably for building the Brahadishwara temple. Since an entire lecture is going to be devoted to the two Brahadishwara temples, I am not going to spend time on it. He is famous for retrieving the Tevaram and inaugurating the recitation of the, re, reinvigorating the recitation of the Tevaram in temples. Uh, extensive uh, inscriptions. He is probably the king who did the most documentation in Indian history. And he also committed a great survey of lands. And he established contacts with Sri Vidya. Uh, Rajaraja's temple is not just the big temple in, uh, in uh, Tanjavur, but also he has built Rajarajeshwaram in Nagarkoil, Matotam in Sri Lanka and an Arulmuri Swaram in Mysore, which perhaps some of us are not uh, familiar with. 
and in this period some granite temples were built in the Karnataka region. Karnataka is actually famous for soapstone temples of the Hoysalas. But with the granite temples invested with Tamil and Kannada inscriptions were built by Raja Raja. So much that when the Hoysalas took power there, they continued building granite temples for about 100 years with Tamil inscriptions. Raja Raja was followed by Rajendra, Gangai Konda Choda, who marched his army even further, not just the conquest of the northern region of uh, uh, Andhra, but he marched his army to Kalinga, then marched all the way to Ganga and retrieved water from Ganga. So he gave himself the titan of Gangai Kondan and Gadaram Kondan. And Rajendra Chola moved the capital from Tanjavur to Gangai Konda Cholapuram, a new city that he built on the northern banks of the Kolidam. And this country, this city remained the capital of the Cholas until the 12th, 13th century. Rajendra was followed by his sons Raj, Raja Raja, Rajendra and Veera Rajendra. Now this is the extent of Rajendra's empire, not just the South India, but East India, Indonesia and uh, <coughs> parts of Southeast Asia. Compare that to Vijayalaya's kingdom which it started out with. That is the size of Vijayalaya's kingdom early on. Uh, since for lack of time I am going to quickly go through this. The Chola dynasty in the, in the male line ends with Rajendra's uh, son Veera Rajendra. But his daughter Amanga Devi married Rajaraja Narendra who is the son of the Chalukya prince. Uh, son of the Vimaladitya who is the other Chalukya prince who married Kundavai, the sister of Rajendra. Uh, that is a very elaborate description in one sentence but I think the family tree tells you something at which point their son Kulotunga the first famous by made famous by the Kalingatu Parani took over and his lineage even though he was Chalukya in the male, male lineage he call himself the Chola and the dynasty continues at that point um, after Kulotunga there is a slow reduction of the empire and the temple building activity after that also ceases except for two temples Dharaswaram and Tribuna which are going to be discussed by Kodavail, Mr. Kodavail Balasubramaniam. So, and which was then continued by Pandya, Vijayanagar, Nayak and Maratha periods. And so I will end with the slide of the Dharasuram temple. And once again, thank you very much for the opportunity of uh, letting an amateur talk in front of such an august audience of scholars. Bhakti movement and how they started constructing granite stone temples and the economy of Cholas. Now, we have five minutes of time. Oh, okay. I would like to invite Rotarian President Venkatesh to hand over the memento to Sri Gopu.